Hi. Good afternoon. I'm Subaya Venkata, Senior Manager at Google. I'm happy to be here with you today. Let's get started. We are going to talk about seamlessly migrating your networks and workloads into GCP. So what is Agenda? Next slide. So we have three speakers here today. I'm Subaya. I'm going to talk about why and how you should migrate your networks into GCP. Then Ines is going to talk about specific use cases and service model. Then the concluding remarks and hybrid use cases are talked by Amit. So why you should migrate your workloads into Google Compute Engine? What is so special about it? What are the advantages of Google Compute Engine? If there is anything you want to take out today, this is the slide you should remember. This is the one slide we captured everything. Google networks are great. The performance is amazing. We can get 14 GBPS throughput, single zone, VM to VM. Similarly, we can give 100 microseconds round trip latency, VM to VM, single zone. This is very amazing. We'll talk about how we are able to actually achieve this high throughput and load latency in the next slide. Coming to how fast you can actually bring up VMs in Google Cloud. You can bring up like one VM, two VM, up to 1,000 plus VMs. Thousands of VMs you can bring in a couple of minutes. An average three to five minutes, you can have 1,000 VMs up and running. Third, in network performance, you can have, we implemented a seamless, hitless upgrades of our infrastructure. That includes kernels, our hypervisors, software-defined stack, so many components without having any kind of network performance degradation for the VMs. We were able to do that behind the scenes migration of VMs, upgrade the stack, and move the VMs back in. Second, global network. It is not just the GCLB global VIP. It's much more than that. From the beginning, we designed and architected the networking stack with a global view in mind. That means you can create a virtual network in any zone, multiple zones across regions. Thousands of VMs, you can scatter them in all the different zones. You can have high throughput and high latency. The last one is network functions as service. We have spent last year, entire GCP, 320 plus features and functions. Networking alone, we have tens of features and functions we implemented in one year. Thanks to our great design and architecture of software different networking stack, we we're able to churn out features so fast. Now we have all the necessary and sufficient functions for you to migrate your workloads and networks into Google Cloud. Those include networks, virtual networks, subnetworks, HTTP load balancing, HTTPS load balancing, TCP load balancing, UDP load balancing, cloud DNS, cloud CDN, cloud VPN, cloud router, so on and so forth. We'll talk about all these different categories next. Let's step back. I talked about getting a 14 GBPS of throughput and 100 microseconds of latency. This is not possible in a day or a week or even years. If you look at the Google's history, Google has spent decade or so plus of innovation, perseverance, a lot of money, resources spent, and meticulously designing the networks. 
Google networks are amazing. This is a good example where you can see that we publish papers in seminal sitcoms and reputed journals. In 2013, we published a paper in B4 van traffic engineering. This is a groundbreaking paper on first of its kind to do software-defined networking at a global scale of a WAN network. Similarly, we published a paper in 2015 SICOM about how we architected our software-defining clusters. We started with Firehose clusters in 2005 and Watchtower clusters in 2008, 2012 Saturn clusters, finally in Jupyter clusters. All of these are available, published in a paper called Jupyter Rising. These Jupyter clusters are fantastic latency and very high throughput than anyone in the world. Then in 2014, we published a blog post about Andromeda. Andromeda stack powers all of Google's compute engine networking stack. With this SDN architecture of Andromeda, it's possible for us to implement features, any kinds of features, not just external features, internal features, including isolation, encryption, encapsulation. All of these features are possible because of our design of Andromeda. To recap, you can see that we have software-defined WAN, we have software-defined clusters, finally we have software-defined cloud virtual networks. Because of that, it's possible to see and get like very high throughput and very low latency. We are not going to stop there. Over the years, we are going to see amazing results because of these investments. So let's step back and look at what are the different cloud networking tools and functions available. We categorize them after listening to you into four different categories. The basic, the fundamental first building block is our virtual networks. As we discussed, you can create virtual networks, virtual machines, containers across the globe, crossing different regions in a single API. Then, last year we released more granular subnetworks. You can group a set of IP addresses, VMs, or containers into a sub-granular group by zone or by region. We'll get to how the subnetworks, IP addressing, and naming works in the next slide. Coming to the second point, what about control? People ask, would like to see the control and security? Control is very important. How can, as an organization, trust certain individual get access to manipulate the resources? Certain people actually get to change, certain people get to only view the resources. We have given a couple of networking IAM functionalities called network admin role, network user role, security admin role, and instance admin role for IAM, which is in beta right now. And then once you have the control set up, how about the firewalls? I would like to ensure the security of my networks. Which VM is supposed to talk to which other VM? I need the control. Then we have the firewall solution. You can get up to 200 firewalls rules with very granular scale or very microscopic scale. You can configure them. Based on reputation, you can get even more firewall rules. These firewall rules are both at L3 level and L4 level. And you can actually apply them at the name, target name, or IP range level. The global scale. For web serving applications, we delivered all necessary load balancing features like SSL load balancing, TCP, UDP load balancing, HTTP load balancing, HTTPS load balancing, DNS, and Cloud CDN. This tool set is sufficient for you to click on few buttons in the UI and actually deploy your web serving applications, as the previous talks talked about. The final one is hybrid offerings. If you wanted to partially move your application to Google Cloud, you want to extend out, you want to scale out your on-premise sites into Google Cloud, we have three different products. Cloud VPN, we have do IPsec VPNs, which does 1.5 GBPS per tunnel. 
We'll talk about that later. And then we have cloud router functionality where you can BGP, BGP functionality to dynamically learn the topologies and learn about the changes between on-premise sites and Google Compute Engine. The final one we have is cloud interconnect. You can connect directly to us or to you through a carrier exchange. This entire set of features is now sufficient, necessary, for you to migrate to Google Cloud. We'll see how we use all of these features to migrate your workloads. Then let's step back and see an example architecture before we migrate like a couple of use cases. How does all these things fit together visually? For example, you have a startup or organization. I would like to see how all of this fit together. Think that on the left-hand side, you have Google Global Network go physical network in different regions, and each region has zones. In other side, you have an organization set up where you have given certain privileges to certain individuals. Then the network admin comes along. In the UI, he just creates with a few button clicks a virtual network. And then he divides the virtual networks into sub-networks. Another few button clicks. It's available. You can create up to hundreds of subnetworks in a particular region. And then security admin comes along with a different IAM role. Hey, I'm a security admin. I would like to secure your subnetworks and VMs in this fashion. For example, say that only one subnetworks get to access the private in public internet. The rest of the subnetworks are not supposed to access the internet. All of this is possible through security firewall rules. And then comes along service accounts. We have enabled service accounts so that you can access Google Cloud Storage APIs, other Google services with a specific, that means specific only VMs and applications can use our Google services. You can do that through service accounts. This is also another form of security. Then network admin comes along, creates Cloud DNS, and starts serving through load balancing that you have seen before. And then you want to see that, oh, no, actually, I have a couple of on-premise data centers. I would like to connect them. Then in one of the sub-networks, in one of the regions, you bring up cloud VPN and cloud router functionality and start connecting to your on-premise data centers very securely through IPsec tunnels. These are all the building blocks. Some of them are, for example, missing, but you can visualize this, cloud interconnect and how this works. This is how the networking model we architected and designed. This is a global scale one. Let's look at how is the IP addressing. IP addressing and naming are very fundamental for networking. If you, you have to get this right. So we have spent a lot of amount of time talking to customers, talking to you, getting the input to see actually how can we provide a seamless migration for you. The moment you go into the cloud console and create an account for Google, create the project, you get a default network. You don't have to create any network. We call it default network is pre-created for you. Inside the default network, we create auto mode subnetworks. We have two different modes of subnetworks we create. By auto mode, we pre-create one subnetwork in every region. These are non-overlapping, non-contiguous different ranges. We pick the addressing range for you. You don't have to know what is the addressing for you. Then you come along and say, I'm a power user. I don't want you to create actually automotive subnetworks. I want to create many such subnetworks. For example, you may say that each of my service, I wanted a subnetwork. Maybe group of my services, I wanted a subnetwork. You can do that. You can create up to 100 such subnetworks in a network. You can see in one of the regions, we have two subnetworks. There are more than there are more advantages of customer subnetworks. You can bring in your own private address space into Google Cloud. We have no restrictions. You can bring in the entire RFC 1918 space for you. RFC 1918 space consists of three different networks: 10/8, 117/16/12, 190 to 116/16. All of these things available for you to use. And then we have a flexible allocation model. 
You don't have to create contiguous subnetworks. You can create very random subnetworks from the IP space. As much as hundreds of subnetworks you can create. With reputation, actually, you can increase the subnetworks too. And these are expandable. That's very key, important. For example, you created a subnetwork range, slash slash 20, slash 24, let's say. The number of VMs increased because of your load increased. With the click of a button, you can change the subnetworks. You can increase it from slash 24 to slash 20. You can go all the way up to slash 9 if you want. Now, from now onwards, we are going to step by step increase the complexity of migrations. Let's look at traditional data centers. How traditional data centers are visualized and then how the cloud is visualized, one by one, step by step. In a traditional DC, you can see complex networking setup. You have top of rack switches, you have clause networks, for high cross-sectional bandwidth from server to server, you have to design with OR subscription, different, different buffer ratios or whatnot. And then you have an aggregation layer where you combine multiple such clusters and export services out to the internet. Then you have a DMZ perimeter to come create all the security rules. You buy some boxes from different vendors. You buy different boxes for the load balancers. You attach the load balancers and security actors there. Some of them are L2, some of them are L3. I think you have to translate the VLANs into L3. There are so many things you have to do in the traditional on-premise one. In cloud, everything is gone. You have a UI in front of you. Everything is consistent. Everything is done for you behind the scenes using REST APIs. Click on a few buttons. All of these things will be migrated. So you don't have to think about no more clause networks. No more these top of rack switches. Everything is perceived from the perspective of your services and virtual machines. All you have to think about it, I have a set of VMs. Think that these VMs are all connected together. They're all connected in a full mesh. You get like more than 10 Gbps of VM to VM throughput and 100 microseconds of latency. Why do you care about the networks anymore? You don't need to worry about clause networks. So just create a bunch of subnetworks, put the VMs in the subnetworks, they have web servers. I created a subnetwork for web servers. I created a VMs for application servers through button clicks. And then I bought some storage, maybe Google Cloud Storage. And I have a big query attached to it. Another button, click on some buttons, you create a load balancer, single whip, done. So no more thinking in the perspective of complex networking terminology anymore. Everything is through REST APIs. Behind the scenes, Google takes care of all the migration for you. From now, Inus is going to talk about service model and very specific use cases. The batch use cases, web server application use cases. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It is really great to be here today. It is. Uh, such exciting times for us. And as you heard Subaya saying, we've been really, really busy. So hopefully you're going to be as excited as we are on uh, what we are delivering uh, to you in terms of capabilities. And I want to start uh, by uh, recapping on uh, what Subaya said, uh, because it's really important as the foundation of what we do. So there's three uh, things that he uh, pick up on. Uh, those are network performance first and all the work that is being done in Google infrastructure to get where we are uh, today, which powers everything we do. And it is really in our DNA. We uh, talk about the global scope. Uh, Google is a global network and everything we do, it is in that spirit. Uh, we provide private connectivity globally and then we uh, give you the flexibility to then uh, choose uh, whether you want the granularity to build regionally and uh, have the flexibility of communication uh, within the scopes that you need. Then the third thing is everything as a service, uh, everything meaning networking functions in this case, uh, so that we are really providing the level of abstractions that you need so you can map your services and we'll take care of the rest for you. So 
Having said that, uh, what I want to talk to you about is how do you um, use uh, those capabilities for what you need, for bringing your services to the cloud and mapping them flexibly. The first uh, way uh, I find useful uh, thinking about this is about the services. What the service needs, and that's going to, uh, that is going to somehow determine what are the type, uh, the type of capabilities that you'll need in uh, our Google Cloud. And during Good Hands, uh, we can cover a lot of uh, different models. You can have services that are uh, latency sensitive, so they need to be served locally, and you need to be close to the user for low latency. You can have services that require failure isolation, and you need to be conscious about your failure domains and how you build geographically as well and in which scopes your services to provide that redundancy. Replication, you may want to have global replication for services like uh, databases. And then security and privacy, very important. Who has permissions to do what and how services can communicate with each other. So, if you think about what the services need, I think you can then uh, have this model on what you need in the network. So services, we provide um, templates, service identities, uh, so that you can build your services with uh, policies, with recipes that you can replicate, you can automate, and you can scale. With the requirements of the grouping, it comes the network uh, virtual, uh, the virtual network grouping and the subnetworks grouping. Do you need global communication? You can bring a network global scope and build the granularity of what you need with subnetworks, configuring your CIDR grouping so that they can communicate as you need. So for data locality, you can build your subnetworks regionally, and then you can communicate globally if you need uh, things like data replication or a service that is consuming from uh, publishers that are uh, distributed all over the world. And of course, then, all these maps into geography. So what is the failure domains that you need? What is the availability that you need? And then you can come up with your strategy on how to map those into the different zones, regions that we provide. And then on top of all this, it comes the organization. And again, is who has the control to do what? And this is very important so that uh, there is autonomy for the services to operate and set up policies. But at the same time, there is a framework for network administrator and for SecOps to be setting the rules that are going to, uh, that need to be conformed within the uh, infrastructure. So very practically, uh, you will define your service as a policy based on templates and then based on the um, regional mapping on data locality that you need. You can choose to use subnetworks. And based on the needs uh, for uh, global communication, you can use uh, global networks. And then you can apply policy to those. And those are uh, security rules, fire firewall rules that govern how those services can communicate. And on top of that, you have the organization and the control. I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through a couple of uh, use cases that I think it reflect uh, uh, some of these mapping and capabilities that you might find useful in our network infrastructure. For mobile serving, it is important to serve close to the user. So again, data locality, the service as close as, uh, to the user as, as, as possible, you can have uh, the service replicated in different regions. You can, uh, in the migration scenario, you can get access to the uh, cloud scale. And at the same time, if you are thinking of expanding, you have access to uh, the data locations and the regions that we provide. You may have an owner for those services. Uh, that is separate from the service of, uh, for instance, the data processing. And you have a, I'm going to break some news here, global LB. So it is going to be a single BIP 
that is going to be uh, using, used for all the traffic, but again, serving to the, uh, from the closest location. And you can have a data processing that is, again, a different owner, and you uh, have the capabilities of using the permissions and control to separate those while allowing the communication. I think we've talked about a lot of the uh, capabilities of uh, load balancing, but it's important uh, the uh, global scope, a uh, single VIP serving uh, globally without uh, DNS, the uh, scalability and auto scaling and the performance that comes along uh, with that. Let's go through another uh, scenario, and I want to emphasize here certain things in our capabilities. An example of centralized batch processing. So you have uh, localized databases, and in this case, it's a very simple inventory scenario in which you may have databases in different regions where you keep your data for um, all the uh, inventory of your business. But then you have another different organization that is an audit service and is going to perform data processing queries on what's the status of the databases. And that is centralized. It is a single uh, unit that it needs to, maybe for compliance reasons, find what is the status of those. And you're going to have different owners. Uh, so what do you do? You will need a global network uh, because those services will need to communicate with each other and publish the data to a central location that is going to do the data processing. We will need as well some locality. The databases are not located, um, are located spread around the world, but they are grouped in the different regions. So we will need to have the granularity uh, of that segmentation in the regions, and you can set the policies there. You can assign the CIDI ranges uh, to map those region uh, uh, segments into your CIDRs. And then you'll have an ETOPS uh, administrator that is going to take uh, the responsibility of setting that up for the whole organization. You're setting the database. You have an owner for that database and will be responsible of uh, configuring the service, administering that service. You could use automated templates like uh, uh, deployment manager, cloud launcher, and you just can spin the services very easy with a click. Then you have a centralized, uh, let's say in this case, data proc, uh, manage uh, Hadoop Spark, and that's going to be central. So this is the audit that is going to be processing the data for the compliance of uh, the, um, the data in the inventory. You need to set up firewalls. The SecOps is going to set the policies on each of those uh, services and subnetworks and decide uh, how they are going to communicate with each other. And then data can be published to a centralized location. You could use PubSub uh, and then just uh, the private the scope communication is going to allow you to do that uh, seamlessly without having to do any type of uh, um, additional mechanisms to privately connect the, those uh, regions. So again, uh, there is important aspects here about uh, private global communication, the control of the users that are going to be set in the different services, the segmentation policies that are going to be applied to the network, to the subnetwork, or to the VM level granularly. And again, uh, everything that powers our network is with uh, high performance in scaling, in throughput, and in low latency. With that, I really thank you all for being here. And I'm going to welcome Amit Singhal, who's a tech lead, who's going to be talking about uh, hybrid scenarios. Thanks, Ines. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. So today I'll talk about hybrid clouds and uh, how Google managed services really make it simple and easy to provision them. So hybrid cloud is an essential part of the strat migration strategy for any enterprise. Most enterprises have uh, invested 
in some way in their on-premises uh, traditional data center or building their private clouds. So they want to leverage their existing investment in private cloud or their data center. And so they want to continue to host static core components there and extend on-premises for growth in public cloud and host services that require rapid scaling into public cloud. And this also allows them to uh, do phased migration into public cloud while they're evaluating various components of it. So now we'll go into some common scenarios that use hybrid cloud. And I'll go in depth into one of them to show how managed services like cloud VPN and cloud router make it really simple to provision hybrid clouds. So in this first scenario, uh, there's an enterprise who has set up their private cloud to host their web services. And they want to keep it that way. But now they have a need for analytics and log processing. And they don't have a great infrastructure for that in their private cloud. So they decide to use GCP for that. So they spin off a managed Hadoop service into public cloud. And to feed data from on-premises to this managed Hadoop service, they need a secure connection. And cloud VPN service makes it really simple to provision that. Now I'll move on to second scenario. It's a hypothetical setup from an e-commerce uh, enterprise. And they have their traditional data center, but they have uh, set up their web services into GCP because they want to leverage auto scaling. But in their data center, they have uh, customer sensitive uh, payment information, so they want to run their uh, payment processing application from on-premises. In addition, they also have uh, their IT corporate in on-premises and also employee subnets uh, on-premises. So again, they want a secure connection uh, to GCP, and they use Cloud VPN for it. Now let's go a little more in depth into uh, Cloud VPN service. So Cloud VPN is, it provides an IPsec tunnel. It supports both Ike version V1 and V2. It also supports both global and regional model. So currently I show here that there's a VPN connection only in one region and it is used from both regions. But now customer can choose to spin off another VPN in another region. And using that, they can ha that allows for traffic to egress and ingress uh, locally. And Cloud VPN is a completely managed uh, service. It, all you need to give is public IP on both peers and a shared secret password, and that's it. So it supports high throughput, up to 1.5 gigabit per second on a single tunnel. And we also support like horizontal scaling. So you can start like multiple VPN tunnels from a single region. Now this sets up a VPN tunnel, but you also require routing to be set up on both ends for traffic to go over VPN tunnel. And one way to do that is using static routes. So this is a good option for uh, networks which are uh, small and like relatively static. So now we'll go into some uh, scenarios where networks are changing dynamically and uh, they change frequently. And we'll see like how we can use other uh, managed services to make it easy to provision. So in this scenario, uh, I'm showing that uh, now uh, Customers' web service traffic is increasing in one of the regions, so uh, it's scaling up and subnet size is growing. Next, IT spins off a corporate app in uh, GCP. And then uh, in on-premises, one of the employee subnets uh, is divided into two for isolation reasons. So now with all these changes happening, if you don't want to intervene manually every time and reconfigure static routes, what you can do is like start a cloud router. Cloud router runs BGP protocol 
to auto discover network changes on either side uh, of your network and you need, uh, you can start one cloud or cloud router in every region you have vpn and it's also a completely managed service it pairs with bgp router on premises and it advertises all subnets of the region to on premises and all you need to do is like select dynamic routing when you're configuring your vpn and for bgp peering we use link local ip addresses and this also helps in preventing any conflict with other private address space you have on either side of your network for asns you configure a private asn on gcp for on premises you can give your public asn or use a private asn and that's all you need to do to configure cloud router now i'll talk about some of the advanced features of cloud router which allow for high availability in failure scenarios cloud router supports graceful restart feature what that means is that if your bgp service on premises goes down for any reason cloud router will preserve routes learned from on premises for up to 3 minutes and your traffic will not be disrupted it will still continue to flow over vpn tunnel it also supports ecmp so now if you have multiple tunnels from a region and they are all announcing same bgp routes and so that will allow to distribute traffic equally among all the tunnels another useful feature is to configure multiple tunnels in a primary backup mode and how it does is that if bgp on this tunnel is announcing same routes but with different properties then based on the value of this properties one tunnel will be configured primary and other can be backup and the properties we use is med value as path length as prepend so now if like one tunnel goes down uh, the other takes over and this is really fast because the backup tunnel was already pre provisioned and it can just take over immediately so now we have seen that how google managed services like cloud router cloud vpn make it really simple to provision a secure connection to gcp with auto discoverable networks now to conclude this talk i will recap why gcp so first and foremost it's about network performance gcp delivers high throughput and low latency it is highly scalable reliable and always available it provides global network with virtual private networks that span globally across all regions and last but not the least it provides managed services like v cloud vpn cloud router cloud dns and many more as virtualized network functions for high scalability and availability so with that i conclude this talk thank you